for today. This is an on-site and online seminar organized by Thailand Bioresource Research Center, TBRC, and the National Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology, Biotech, which supported by the Office of the Permanent Secretary for the Ministry of Higher Education, Science, Research, and Innovation, and the National Science and Technology Development Agency, NSTDA. This seminar is part of the seventh annual conference of the ASEAN Network on Microbial Utilization and Micro. Today, we will divide the lecture into two episodes, starting from the evolutionary tree, the weapons of molecular phylogeneticists, and followed by how phylogeneticists use their weapons applications. Please note that we will have 10 minutes break between the episodes. The last session will be Q&A session, open for the audience to rinse the questions. For those who attend an online, there is a Q&A section on the right side of the screen where you can write questions to the speaker. We ask that you select all panelists in the drop-down menu so that the speaker and the organizer may see your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to introduce to our today's speaker, Assistant Professor Dr. Praved Atta Watana Wong from Division of Bioinformatics and Data Management for Research, Faculty of Medicine, Sirirat Hospital, Mahidol University. Dr. Praved received a PhD in systematic biology from Uppsala University in Sweden. His research focuses on related area of molecular sequence analysis, microbial genomics, microbial diversity and evolution, and microbiome. Audience, please welcome Assistant Professor Dr. Praved. Thank you very much, and good morning, everyone, in here and also online. Um, the, first, the first talk will be on the evolutionary tree. The main concept of this talk, I, I, I like to introduce you the term, the important term about um, molecular phylogenetics and also the concept, the big concept, how to interpret molecular phylogenetic in the proper way, okay? I, uh, based on my experience, I realized that lots of biologists still use um, um, molecular phylogenetics in not a very correct way. So, so today, we, we try to adjust the knowledge and share the experience together, okay? Let me start from the very, very ancient phylogeny. Um, this is my favorite slide. Uh, hang on. This is the Charles Darwin's notebook. Okay, he wrote on the top of the notebook, he, he said, I think, and he draw a picture. Okay, if you see, the picture, that is very, that very old phylogeny. Uh, he said A and B, probably closely related. The idea of, of, of this page is let you know the phylogeny are relying on evolutionary, uh, evolutionary theory of Darwin. So all species on Earth are connected, are related. Okay, if someone proves that some species are not related, so phylogeny are collapsed. Okay, we believe all connected, but the way they connected each other, that depend on, depend on uh, how far of the, the time they split each other. If you see the, the three on page, A and B are connected, probably C and B are more closely related than A and B, something like that. And this is the visualization of, of the evolutionary pathway, okay? So 
the assumption of phylogeny is all species are connected. And the idea of the phylogeny starts from, from Darwin's notebook. Actually, there are some more idea that, that built up the, the, the phylogeny. And later on, Heckel and the other scientists trying to draw the phylogeny as the tree. If you, if you see the first picture, uh, the trees look like a very big tree, and they put the species or organisms on each branch of the tree. On top of the tree, they put man on, on top. So the idea of phylogeny starts built up by higher organism and lower organisms, something like that. But actually, the evolution is no direction. The reason I say no direction because all species are advanced in, in their habitat. We cannot live in the water like fish, and bird cannot live in the city like us. So every organism are advanced. They evolve until they fit to that habitat, okay? The tree is trying to transform itself to the second picture. Second picture, so on the stem, on the the deep stem divided to be two or three branching, main branch. One side go through plant, another side go to animal, and something is, that's not plant and animal belong to protist. And finally, we know bacteria, and the last kingdom is fungi, right? Until phylogeny transform itself to, to be like the the right-hand side picture, that is the, the modern phylogeny we familiar. So the, let's say molecular phylogenetics, actually it is a study of evolutionary relationship. That means all organisms related by evolution, okay? And we use the molecular sequence, I mean DNA sequence, RNA sequence, protein sequence, to generate. The thing you can have now, we call operational taxonomic unit, okay? The operational or OTU, operational taxonomic unit is mean the unit of study that you want to know the relationship. Some people use bacteria, some people use fungi, some people use so many species of fungi or many genus of fungi. So you put A, B, C, D, E, or more, that is operational taxonomic unit. You operate them. You want to know the relationship, something. And we use computational power to simulate the picture behind the A to, D, A to E, okay? So at the tip of the tree, I make this, the cross circle, the black circle. I, I call that the node. That is external node. The external node represents the species that still alive or ex extend species. And we try to simulate picture in the past. So some nodes, I make an uh, open circle. That means hypothetical species. We don't know what is that, but they extinct already. Suppose they happen like this. We don't know this tree is correct or incorrect. Phylogeny cannot prove by barrier of time. Okay, even you have time machine, you probably cannot prove it because nowadays or oh, at the moment some species extinct. We don't know where on Earth, and some new species happen. We also don't know where, so that is very hard to prove. So, based on based on the logic we get the picture like this. So we talk about nodes first, okay? External node represent the living species. Internal node represent extinct species, okay? The line that connect the node each other called branch, okay? Branch determine direction of the, the evolutionary pathway from this Organisms, they evolve to be another pattern of organisms. Okay, branch can be external branch and internal branch. Okay, the external branch connected the external node. That is mean that 
I refer to the very recent evolution. So something evolved to be arts, something evolved to be chimpanzee, something evolved to be bacillus subtilis, something like that. But, but the internal branch, that means something older than this. So they're mostly hypothetical, okay? And at the bottom of the picture, the branch that or nodes that represent the origin of everything, we call root, okay? So we believe all organisms have one root, has one root, okay? That's the concept and the, the, the terminology that you probably need to understand the tree. Let's start, talk about the tree by, by detail. Well, when you see A to E, that means five species. We try to simulate the pattern of five species by, we, we calculate four hypothetical species. That's open circle, okay? From this picture, lots of people can imagine one species that extinct already, chain itself to be another species, but the way they change is not just like easily change. The way they change, they kind of gradual change. They send the genetic from generation to generation, and every generation, every time they, they pass the genetic material, they accumulate small error that call mutation. Some mutation benefit, some mutation can kill them all. So if they kill them all, you cannot detect it. But they accumulate some more benefit mutation until, so, so this is pedigree. When they pass that in the big population, in a very, very long time, so mutation start accumulate and, and organism start showing up with var variation. And variation can be polymorphism. I mean, if some variations benefit and then spread itself to the population, and finally some pattern of polymorphic fix the population, that means organisms change from one pattern to another pattern, okay? When we look back for phylogeny, and one line of phylogeny represent a complex population so many population of the same organisms, okay? They interact each other and exchange genetic material. And one line of population determine complex pedigree and for so many generations. That's the, the, the shorthand writing of the, the long history, okay? So, this is Phylogeny. Phylogeny, you probably need to know the term rooted and unrooted phylogeny, okay? Or pe people may, may call unrooted tree. One, one fact that you need to know that all computational software cannot build a rooted tree. They all produce unrooted tree. Unrooted tree, like this, you know A and B are connected closer A than A and D, okay? That's, you can interpret. You cannot explain the evolution like A evolved to be something and evolved to be B, that's impossible. So make, make the tree more meaning. You probably need to root it. We actually, we need a rooted tree to explain the evolution. Unrooted tree cannot, okay? But the root is important. Why, why I, I put this as the very early slides? Because if this tree has root in the red arrow, the tree will look like this. That, that means A is in our group, and the remaining one side of organism evolved to be A, and another side evolved to be the remain organisms. B, C, D. But if, if you think the root is here, the tree will be, look like this, okay? So A, B, go to another side, and C, D, go to another side. 
something like this. But if, if you think root is here, that means D is an L group, right? And A, B, C go to one side. The thing I, I like to share is three of these are different. If you pick up the wrong one, you go to the wrong story. That's the risk, okay? So the upper, upper row is unrooted tree. The lower one is rooted tree, okay? This is very important. So that the beginning task of phylogeneticists after you calculate tree in computer, you need to root the, root the tree, okay? No root, no interpretation, okay? So how can we root the tree? Start from looking for, well, you need to add some, some species that are unrelated to, to the thing you want to study. We call our group. If you study Bacillus subtilis, so many Bacillus subtilis, you probably add Bacillus something else. If you study genus Bacillus, you probably add some bacteria in other genus. Okay? That is called adding an L group. Another, another technique that most of the software love to do for you, they call midpoint of the longest branch. I, I will go to detail one by one. Start from L group. If you build a tree of bacteria, you get out unrooted tree, thermos, Escherichia, Yersinia, and Lactobacillus. If I want to root it, I will add something, not a bacteria, not a bacterium. In this case, I add methanococcus because it's archaea. So uh, you know like archaea and bacteria are different groups. So root should be in between out group and in group. In this case, we root methanococcus as out group. So you know like thermos is early split, and then they evolve to be something that later on split to be lactobacillus, and Yersinia and Cherichia are very closely related by this tree, okay? Adding our group. But if some people say, okay, I, I, I don't know what is the best out group, can I add human? Because human is not bacteria. The answer is yes. If you add human, the tree will look like this. They, human is quite far from bacteria. Far from bacteria, I mean time they split from bacteria, okay? And then they squeeze the tree picture of everything you want to observe in the very narrow scale. It is so hard to observe the, the branching direction, okay? Which one come first, which one come later? That's called low resolution tree. If you want to have a good resolution tree, you need to have our group that is very close to the, the, the set that you want to study, okay? But sometime, you don't know, you go to the field and, and isolate some bacteria or catching some insect or some plants in the deep forest and kind of brand new. We don't know what is the related species. This is the new family, new genus, new species. So the way they, you can do is midpoint of the longest branch. Let's say if this tree has thermos, lactobacillus, yersinia, and Escherichia, we observe the length of the branch. So the number on, on the branch determine the length. The length related to the genetic distance. Genetic distance means the, the number of change, the mutation accumulation, even nine. That means from that node to thermos is quite different by genetic. That's the meaning. So from this, this tree, you probably calculate the length between all possible pair of OTU, okay, operational taxonomic unit. From this, you know, um, thermos and Escherichia is the longest branch because from thermos go to Escherichia, you need to pass the, the branch that have nine 
unit length and two unit length and four unit length. That's equal to 15. By midpoint of 15, that means 7.5. The root must be in this point because, because the longest one supposed to be the length between out group and in group. That's the idea, but not always correct, okay? But better than nothing, okay? One, fun, one funny example is here. I like this paper, Pokemon Phylogeny. So if you play the computer game Pokemon, they have a statistic of each Pokemon. The height, the length, the weight, whatever. They build up the tree and, well, as you know, Pokemon is not unreal, right? The way they root the tree is midpoint of the longest branch. And they found that the very ancient Pokemons live in water. And then they evolve to be land Pokemon and finally dragon. That's the way of evolution, try to, try to draw a story. So that's funny thing. So um, once you know the tree, you know the rooted tree, the way to interpret the rooted tree, you need to know that the characteristic, the main characteristic of the tree is it can be rotated. From this tree, this is rooted tree. And in this picture, D is supposed to be outgrouped. By, by this picture. If you rotate this branch, you get B and A swap position, okay? But if you rotate more in this position, you get C and AB rotate position. And if you rotate at the beginning, the root of the tree, you get this picture, right? So everyone can follow this, right? But if you rotate again at the, at the root position, you get back to the, the beginning, the first tree. So they all exactly the same tree. You can rotate whatever. Don't let the, the tree in the paper line you, make you confused when you read the tree, okay? Because they can rotate. If you want to make it close, you rotate them to be close. That is not correct, because it can be far, right? Um, unrooted tree also can be rotated, okay? But the, the, the length of branch cannot be changed, okay? Otherwise, the meaning of the tree is changed. That is the, way, uh, the information you probably need to know, it's very important. More than, more than, rotated branch, the tree of, the angle of tree is no meaning, okay? If you get this tree, and, well, once you get the tree, the first thing that biologists love to do is mapping the character on the tree. Uh, if you study character A, you probably say, oh, ABC is similar. Then we should change the tree to be cross each other and draw a uh, oval. Okay, A, B, C is related. You probably see this style of representation in lots of paper, okay? But if, if another team or another friend, your friend study another, another character, um, they might feel like A, B, C, D are related, they move position of D to be the group of ABC. So angle is no meaning. You can flip, flop, whatever, okay? Some people even say D and E look pretty much similar and we want to draw a circle around D and E. That's whatever. So you know that uh, the tree can be rotate and the angle is no meaning. Let, let Test a little bit, exercise the brain in the morning. If I show this tree, okay, the question is B related to C. B is more, we call closely related to C than B to A, right? Or B is 
closely related to A than to C. This is challenging. Okay, keep in mind. I will come back to, to give you a key. The question is B related to C than A or B related to A than C or actually equivalent. Okay. This is the first, the first question. The second question, the frog related to fish than to human, or the frog related to human than the fish, or equal. Equal means the frog related to human equally to the fish, okay? I think you guys have some answer in the mind, in your mind already. Let, let help you organize the idea. This is very important. Think about uh, the pedigree again. If you, this is you, you and your brother, very closely related, you cannot deny this, okay? Because they, you share parent with your brother. You and your brother have the same parent. But you and your cousin, your cousin also related, but not share the, the parent, but you share the grandparent, okay? If I try to lay phylogeny on this pedigree, you probably see you and your brother has joined one note. You and your cousin join a deeper note the note, the deeper, is mean distantly related. Okay, the note that close to you, we term the recent common ancestor or RCA. Okay, RCA is the thing that you need to point on the tree. You need to, to find where is the RCA on the tree to interpret which one is closely related to which one. In this, in this case, you and your brother, are closely related because you and your brother share most recent common ancestor, MRCA, okay? And we call you and your brother, we call the, the tax, taxon brother and taxon you call sister taxa. If one side is group, another side is another group, we call sister group, okay? So back to the question. Lots of people make the wrong decision who think B is more closely related to C than A. Okay, because the, the branch is very close to if you draw B to C. Who think B is more closely related to A than C? Uh, because, because A and C share parent. All right, B and C share grandparent. The answer is, B is more closely related to, to A because B and A share parent. But just you and your brother look different. That's it. Okay? Because one, one branch is quite long. That's the reason. For this tree, frog is more closely related to fish than human. Right? Lots of biologists, when you when they grims on this, this tree, because flock and fish, they lay on the position quite close to each other. And they live in water. That's this thought, the, the way of interpretation. Flock and human share uh, the node X. Okay? Flock and fish share the node Y. Node X is more recent common ancestor than not why. That's the answer is, flock is more closely related to human than fish. Don't, re don't forget that the tree can be rotated. If you rotate the node X, flock will go to very far, the position that's quite far from fish and human come close, right? That's no meaning. So don't, don't grims on the line of OTU, but need to observe the, the branch position, the, the node position, that's more important. 
So I, I normally make a question to test students when I'm teaching. This is the fancy question. I pick up three questions for you to test. Uh, you can go to, to see the, a lot more questions in the reference here. In this picture, uh, they show the tree of amoeba as our group and number of green organisms from red alga, green alga, moss, and pine. Okay. If I give you from for 30 seconds, the green alga is more closely related to red alga than moss, or green alga is more closely related to moss than the red alga, or equal, or green alga is related to red, but not related to moss. Who think A? No A. Who think B? Who think C? No C. And no D, right? D is completely wrong. The answer is B, right? Very good. <coughs> so for someone who is not keen in, in plant, so this is the tree of animal. OK, lizard. Lizard is our group. We have crocodile, dinosaur, extinct already, and bird. Crocodile is more closely related to lizard than bird, right? Who think crocodile is more re closely related to a bird than a lizard? Okay. Or equal? No equal. And no D, right? The answer is also B. Okay. So you get some idea? The last one, last one. Um, seal, horse, giraffe, hippopotamus, and whale. So we point a seal is more closely related to horse than a whale. No. Seal is more closely related to whale than a horse. You need to, to point the RCA between seal and horse. That is root, right? Seal and whale, also root, right? Well, the answer is they related equally, okay, in terms of the evolutionary pathway, okay? Right. Well, when you build a tree, one thing that helps you a, a lot for interpretation, uh, I mean, in systematic biology. So I think lots of people want to build a tree because they, you guys working on systematic biology, you want to classify organisms, you want to identify organisms. You need to know the relationship of taxa on the tree. The first relationship is monophyletic. Monophyletic is the, the organisms that share the common ancestor. Okay, uh, monophyletic groups sometimes, particularly microbiologists, love to use the term clade. Okay, clade or monophyletic are the same meaning, including the common ancestor. So the, the white circle and the node, that's the, the ancestor of I and J, and H, I, and J, they are all the same five taxa are, are all monophyletic because from the ancestor they and all descendants, that's monophyletic. Okay? When, when you build a tree and you want to claim something, you need to look for monophyletic. Okay? But lots of time, they conflict with the previous taxonomy. Okay? Taxonomy said B, C, D are grouped together and A is separate one. So you have two groups, okay? A and B, C, D. Well, B, C, D, including uh, ancestor, common ancestor, but some descendant, not all descendant, because they not include A. Something like this we call palaphyletic, okay? Palaphyletic is some missing concept 
Okay. If you detect something paraphilic, you probably need to to change the concept of the the taxonomy. This is not belong to the same thing. Uh, in this case, they're not including A. But if you you feel like E, F, and G is grouped together, that probably polyphyletic polyphyletic determine determine character that's uh, coincidentally similar by two different groups of organisms. E and F are monophyletic, but E F share the same thing with G. That's quite weird because E F came from one line and G came from another line of evolution. So if you detect something like this, you probably converge in evolution or parallel evolution or whatever that is not homology. That's the thing. So people might, might confuse paraphyletic a lot. One solid example is here. It, this is the tree of vertebrate. Start from fridge, silicon. Silicon is living, living fossil, right? Flock is the representative of amphibian uh, and the group of mammal from monotreme, marsupial, and placenta, placental mammal. And then the group is reptile, uh, snake, lizard, turtle, crocodile. You see reptile is paraphyletic because the lie of evolution need to include birds, okay? Birds separate to be another class in invertebrate. So in this case, uh, the class reptilia need to be reconsidered. Actually, they should change the, the concept in taxonomy later on when they accumulate more, more knowledge and concept. Okay, so the site here on the right-hand side, that's the, the taxonomy. But on the left-hand side, you see the, the circle with so many colors. That is systematic. The idea of systematic, we implement the evolution inside the taxonomy. And we, we should classify organisms by the, the pattern of evolution. But if, if uh, reptile and birds are, share the same ancestor, that ancestor, the pink one, called reptile. So the term reptile is kind, kind of confused. When you talk about reptile in systematic, it means it mean class reptilia plus birds. But if you talk about taxonomy, reptiles mean class reptilia. Okay? The reason that we use systematic, when you, when you prove reptile and birds share the same ancestor, that means monophyletic. If this position is incorrect, will you move the whole chunk of the tree to a new position, not just one of them? So that help you organize the position of, of organism in the vertebrate easily. If you remember class, you, you, you need to remember how those class connect each other, okay? Or memo, memo is the blue one. Memo and reptile share in the same ancestor because they produce amnion. We call amniota, something like that. This is the systematic way. Um, <coughs> this is the, the, the term that you probably see by some paper. Uh, we, when you build a tree, you probably need to have a resolved tree, fully resolved. Fully, fully resolved means all nodes split into two organisms, okay? From E, from the origin split to E and ancestor. From ancestor one split to D and another ancestor, something like that. They always split into two organisms. But sometimes you see from one node split to A, B, C. That's mean, that's mean you cannot solve it completely. A, B, C, which one is more closely related? Or that means the marker they use, you use 
the sequence probably not contain phylogenetic signal, okay? You probably use too short sequence, too long sequence, or sequence that, that is not certain or contain noise more than signal, something like that. We call polytomy. Polytomy can happen by so many analysis, but if you, you found polytomy in your phylogeny, you can explain A, B, C, are grouped together if, if the, the trees have high support statistics. But if you want to say A or B or A or C or B or C more closely related, you probably need to do another phylogeny, use larger marker or better marker, something like that. So there are actually two school of thought for evolutionary pathway when you build one is phenetic, another one is cladistic, okay? And lots of people were confused because finally they show up, they visualize the same pattern. Phenetics is the old fashioned, well, nowadays we still use some, they, they have some advant advantages. Phenetic, we care on the appearance, the morphology. If morphology looks similar, we group together. The sequence looks similar, we group together. But the, the cladistic, we care on the, the pattern. Probably just like species B and A, you and your cousins look different, something like that. One, one branch is quite long. Well, when you build a uh, phenetic on the tree, the tree is no evolution meaning. We call dendrogram. This is a safe term when you explain that. But if you use cladistic, you probably built the evolutionary pathway. We call cladogram, okay? Cladogram not consider branch length, but they consider the pattern, which one split first, which one is the latest bit. But phylogenetic care on both, okay? So the length of branch also meaning, that means they accumulate how many mutation on each branch, okay? Uh, right. <coughs> this one is the, the maybe maybe a little bit complicated. I would say the old-fashioned phylogenetic, you probably pick up one gene and sequence the gene, okay? We call the phylogeny as gene tree because you build from one gene. But the, the aim, the big aim of of phylogeny, you, you want to explain, you, use, you want to use the tree to explain the, the pattern of species evolution or species tree. This species tree is something mystery. We don't know that. We try to build gene tree. We hope the gene tree is good enough to have the same picture with species tree, okay? But if you, you need to know the, the, the blue batch line the blue dashed line divide to be one species and another species, the orange and blue, okay? That's no one know. But the thing you know, you pick up one gene and you build the solid line before, before organisms split into species A and B. They need to prepare lots of gene duplication, gene splitting, some population inside the species start to be dissimilar, okay? We cannot split today. If we want to split human to be two population, so the gene inside population A and population B need to be dissociated, okay? So if you pick some gene that early split, you can imagine like the, the way they split is maybe over and underestimate from the real picture, okay? Let's see, the blue, the blue tree is species tree. But if you pick up gene A, gene A has early split. The, the, the time that genes split each other happened before species split. But luckily, you get the same topology. Topology is the, the branching pattern of the blue phylogeny. So, but if you, you pick up the last 
phylogeny by the last gene. The way they split is different. See? They split C1 out from C2 and 3. You don't know, in, in the real case, you don't know the blue, the blue tree. This is theoretical. Okay? So then you get the wrong phylogeny and you draw a conclusion with the wrong concept. That's the point. Okay? So I, I will share you in the next talk how can avoid this. So by the concept, how to build the tree if someone wants to build a tree, how can I get start? Well, start from getting sample sequence. I mean, molecular phylogeny, you sequence, uh, you manipulate sequence, you align sequence, okay? Choose the method. You want to use this in method or correct the method. If you decide, go to correct the method, which one you want to use? There are so many. I picked up three for three general methods that you're supposed to use. Once you decide, I go with maximum likelihood, so-called, I don't know, then you build a tree. And how can people trust this tree? You need to make statistics to, to support the tree, okay? But that's the, the flow of, of phylogeny. We call phylogenetic reconstruction, okay? We not use the term construction because only nature constructs phylogeny but you reconstruct that as a picture, okay? But the detail inside that is more complicated than, than this picture, but just easy concept, okay? To build a tree is very complicated. We will discuss that in the next talk, okay? I'll leave the first talk by this slide. Okay. Okay, thank you, Ajahn Brawe. Um, I have an online question. Yes, please. Is the length of the line is not important in the one clade? Like A has longer than line B rather than line C? Length of the branch is important and also not important. It depends on the question. So it depends on phylogenetic question. If you want to know which one is closely related, uh, a closely related pair, so length is not important. But if you want to measure how different of the, the unit of evolution look alike or dis, dislike, length is also important. And if you want to, to calculate one, one branch, phylogeny has so many branches nowadays, one branch called molecular clock, Molecular clock is mean, well, when you want to observe dinosaur, you can pick up the bone and use carbon dating. You know the time where, uh, the time when the, the dinosaur living. But if you cannot find a fossil, you're working on bacillus, escherichia, something like that, you need to simulate and you need to calculate the time. The length of the branch is very important mm, because they, they they determine number of mutation accumulation along the time. Okay. Thank you. Is there any question in uh, on on this room? Okay, that I you can have the question after we finish all the episode anyway. Um, so we will take a break, about ten minutes break, and we the episode two will resume at ten oh five. Thank you. Um, welcome back. Uh, we will start the episode two on how phylogenetics is used their weapons applications. May I give the microphone back to Dr. Praveen? 
Thank you very much. Um, uh, for this, this talk will be, well, the first talk you, you learn what is phylogeny and the important terms that you probably need to, to know how to interpret, how to understand, how to get closer to phylogeneticist idea. In this talk, you will learn how to apply phylogenetic idea to the research, okay? Let's start from the method for build a tree. Um, I finished the, the first talk by this slide, okay? Let's go point by point. The first point is if you want to build a tree, first thing, you need to formulate the research question. This is very important. There are a lots of research question that is known, that is no need to use phylogeny to solve that. For example, you want to identify the group of organisms that share the similar sequence. If you want to see the similar sequence, you just go to a line sequence, and then you see the similar sequence. You see the conserved area. No need to build a tree. But if you're trying to build a tree with unrelated question, you go to the wrong interpretation way. Okay? So formulate the research question first. Uh, the main research question should be relationships of those organisms on the tree uh, or unknown bacteria, unknown organisms belong to which group of organisms that supposed to be. I found a new or brand new species. What is the closely related organisms or this one belong to which family? Something like that. This is the direct, direct question. Some people working on metagenomic sequence, everything from soil, from water, from feces, uh, they probably want to know this DNA belong to which group of bacteria. So that's phylogenetic need. All right. Once you get the, a strong research question, then you, you need to prepare the data. Data can be sequenced from your experiment or gathering from the database, the fancy version that you download, sequence from NCBI, from JGI, from Golden, from lots of genome bank, DNA bank. This one is, is tricky. I, I like to share like this. If you want to identify species, okay? But based on my experience, people talk about two big methods. One method is sequence, unknown species, and blast. If blast hit something, it should be that species. I mean, the first hit, the best hit, okay? Another method is blast and gathering the first 20 sequence and build a tree. Okay? Both are incorrect. If, let, let imagine, if they have five species indeed on Earth, you, you have no idea how many indeed, right? But if there are five species in this genus, and people investigate and discover A and E, just only two species, A and E, then they submit the sequence A and E in GenBank, right? One day, you are so lucky, you find species B. B is closely related to A. Once you blast, they hit A, because there are no B on GenBank. This is not species A. If you do this, you never find a new species at all. If there are some mutation happen. Well, two mutation, two substitution, not exactly similar to A. Is that B or A? 
you don't know. Three mutation can be B yet, or four mutation, or five mutation, or how many mutation, right? You need to build a tree. Okay, you need to build a tree. I'll we'll go to the detail of this. Once you're gathering sequence, a number of sequence, so many species, lots of people will think like that's enough. We start doing build the tree. It's too fast. You probably need to identify homology. Organisms evolve from the first one, right? And then divide to be so many species. You need to, to identify this gene. Well, when you want to compare hand, you can compare arms and front legs of cow. That's homologous structure. They evolve from the same thing, from molecular also. This gene and the gene from the other species are exactly the, the same. I mean, ex exactly the same. I mean, homo homology. They evolve from the same origin or not. That's the challenging. Once you get the, the gene, how do you know gene X in the other organisms duplicate to be three copies? Which copy is the correct one? If you put up the wrong copy, branch length is changed and might be drive to the position of the organism on the tree, the distort, right? So there are so many ideas. We are not have a solid protocol, okay? I share you, uh, this is the idea that, that I use it. Um, if you, we have tons of species, we pick up three big different. And we identify orthologue by two different species, A and B, A and C, B and C, okay? We spend lots of time to identify orthologue, and then that orthologue must be shared among, well, A and B and C. They need to be orthologue. I get a group of sequence, okay? Then I blast to the other, other genome. The reason we try to build the tree based on the genome sequence because, because we know how many copies in that genome. If you get up one gene from NCBI, you, you have no idea. In that genome, the genome that scientists sequence and submitted, there's tons of copies or not. But if you get things from genome sequence, you can rule. Well, we don't want to, we, well, if you want to deal with gene family, tons of copy. For example, in cows, in domestic dog, I mean, you need to spend a lot of power or energy to screen which one. I, for me, I just pick up and throw away the, the multiple copy. I just go on with single copy, that easiest. Once we get a number of single copy orthologue, then we just start working on phylogeny. So you, you, you know like there are some genes that meet out from the beginning. If you get gene X and you work with 10 species, maybe species 9 lost gene X. How can you compare? Because species 9 have problem. You need to identify the universal gene core gene, or once you get a number, for example, 300 universal gene, but some gene is too, too short, maybe ribosomal protein, that's maybe 105 nucleotide, super short. That is not enough phylogenetic signal. We probably throw it away. We need a longer gene, have area, have room for mutation, okay? That's the point. And then, once you get orthologue, you need to align. Identify orthologue is identify homology, but alignment is also identify homology by position. You get a gene, but gene has tons of, maybe thousands of nucleotide. How do you know this nucleotide orthologue or homologue with the other nucleotide from another organisms? That is another challenging, okay? So basically when 
people align. This is multiple sequence alignment, or people may call MSA. You can see the area of the green color we call conserve. And the area with the red colors we call non-conserve that happen by uh, insertion or deletion, we call indel, okay? Some indel is pretty much beautiful, like the right-hand side indel. You can see present and absent. But some indels on the left-hand side is very difficult to, to manage or work with. So I term it simple indel and complex indel. So we throw away indel because the, the difference between sequence in the green area happened by substitution, okay? The red area happened by insertion deletion, okay? Phylogenetic model, I mean, lots of computational software implement substitution model. But if you try to put the, the indel model in their input inside, they try to, to think like gap is the fifth character. Instead of four ATCG, DNA can be five states, something like that. If you want to deal with in there indeed, that's very complicated, okay? <laughs> but that's not mean you, you cannot do, you can do, but you need to implement more steps to work with, okay? So basically, people identify conserved area and throw away the gap region in their region. Well, you need to know gap is unreal. Gap is human-made, okay? In nature, there is no gap. DNA connect each other, okay? Gap is human-made, but in there is nature, have nature invent, because some area like the, the, the left-hand side you see the very ugly alignment. That means this region has bombarded with insertion and deletion all the time until some pieces in integrate are uh, missed out. So we, we have no idea yet. You need to throw it away. Uh, I, I made a software that helped you in identify uh, called Seek Fire, but now I doubt the, the, the website because we, we try to make it the second version. Uh, but you can request for the standalone version. It's pretty much easy. Uh, how Seek Fire recognize Indel start from Seek Fire scan the alignment. Okay, they recognize the gap region. Gap region is mean the area that contain gap. The column in the alignment, any column that contain gap, we call gap column. If the gap column that concatenate, we call one gap region. Okay, in this alignment, you have four gap region. The first gap region have four gap column, something like that. Okay, sometime the gap region beside of the gap region, supposed to be conserved region. The conserve depend on uh, user defined. If user think 70% is conserved, then 70%. So user can, can adjust the number of, of similarity. But if you set 70% and column beside the gap region is less than 70%, that mostly happen by the errorness of the alignment software. They don't know how to put the, the position of that amino or nucleotide, so then put aside to make one big gap to keep the score better. That's the idea. The idea might be, the, the, correct, the correct one might be two different gap that's more accurate, but software will try to push everything aside Seek Fire will implement the unaligned or unconserved region to be one part of the gap region. Okay, we call Indel. And some Indel, that is close each other. We know this is Indel because by left 
hand side and right hand side need to have at least three column of conserve. But this one has one column of conserve that lists, well, the number of three, you can adjust to up to 10. Even longer, that means this index is more confident, okay? Then they merge to be one in their region. So finally, we have three in their region. Need to throw it away from the alignment. <coughs> so in there is not easily by observing by eyes. Okay. Once you manipulate sequence, you need to choose the method between distance and character. The distance is convert the sequence alignment to, to be a matrix. They compare the difference between A and B, A and C, all combination, okay? And you get a set of metrics. Your DNA sequence is probably super long and huge, but they convert to be a small matrix. And working with the matrix, that's very fast, okay? The good point of distance method is quite quick. But you need to, to compensate with the less accuracy. But I will not say this one is not good. It's very good, but not great. Okay? So nowadays, people still use this method for huge phylogeny. If you want to build a tree, maybe 1,000 phylogeny, you need to go on with the distance and to see like how many trees get the same topology as an idea. You can't do character. Character based need, well, you probably retire before the, the, the last three come out. Um, the character based method, we care on uh, alignment column by column. So all column need to be take into account and calculate, that's why the calculation time is quite long. Uh, from my experience, calculation of a genome bacteria, 1,000 bacterial genome uh, with 70,000 position, I mean alignment, and I collect just only 70,000 column with 1,000 row on mini server, it spent longer than a month. Okay, but it's impossible to do, to do by personal computer. If you have a huge computer soft server, you probably spend like one or two weeks. Okay, and you, we, well, we need to think about that. Trying to make you understand easier based uh, by distance and character. If you, you do mathematic question. Try imagine, if you're working on mathematical question, you know how to solve the question by equation. You have equation in your mind. You just calculate. And you get y equal this, that distant method. You have algorithm. You have the idea how to calculate that. Okay? That is distance. But character, character base, I would do like uh, maximum likelihood I will gathering 1,000 students working on the same question, okay? The student may end up with A, B, C, D, multiple choice, okay? And I, I count how many students say A, how many students say B, C, and D, and I go to the, to the right answer by most of students say it. So that's why calculation need to repeat so many times. And actually, it's not thousand, maybe million, something like that. If I go with Bayesian in inference, Bayesian even more consume power. Bayesian means I gathering students for 1,000 school, and one school have 1,000 students, do maximum likelihood in each, each school, and get, okay, this school say A, this school say B, this school say C. I, I want to know, like, among thousand schools, say what? So they, they claim the accuracy is more, it's higher than distance, but you, you need to take some time. Before we go to character base, 
for phylogeny. Um, the guideline is you probably need to go with maximum likelihood and Bayesian inference, two methods. And if two methods same, say the same tree, you just show one tree. And say in the text, in the paper, like another tree is, have the same topology. But you put the score from that tree on, well, sometimes the tree you have two, three number on each branch. That's because they, they do a maximum likelihood, Bayesian, maybe neighbor joining, and they get the same topology. No need to show three different shape because the shape are exactly the same, okay? Um, well, <coughs> if the, the, the ML and BI tree end up with different, different topology, don't panic. You explain the part that is similar. The part that they different, that means the, your sequence has no power to separate that. Or you need to build another tree from another marker to solve this problem, okay? Uh, to make you understand how character base takes some time for calculation, you need to know the term tree space. Tree space is the number of possible phylogeny. This is unrooted phylogeny. The smallest unrooted phylogeny is three taxa, A, B, C. You can draw A, B, C like this. You cannot draw in the other shape. Okay, this is the smallest one. Okay. All right. But if you have four taxa, A, B, C, D, it should be how many tree happen. See, if you add taxon D here, you get this tree. D will go together with A, right? If you add D in this position, D will go together with C, closely related with C. If you add D with B, D and B will closely relate it. So finally, if you have four taxa, you have three different phylogeny. Your task is pick up one from three. One from three is the correct. So you need to pick up which one, okay? Different technique, maximum likelihood, Bayesian or whatever, there are techniques to help you pick up the best three with some score, okay? But if you have five, A, B, C, D, E, if you add E here, E and A will closely be related. If you add E at this position, you end up with this. If you add E in the middle, E will be in the middle. Also, if you add E with B, E and B will closely relate it. And also here. But you have two more phylogeny. Then if you have five taxa, you need to choose one from 15. Okay? But no one published paper with five species, right? You have tons of species. You, you love to have a huge tree, right? But if you have 20 taxa, this is number of possible phylogeny that you need to pick one from this number, okay? That's the idea of character base. They help you cut down the other unwanted tree, unpossible tree, and you finally pick up the last one. Mm. We, we rule out the, the choice. Maximum likelihood can help you calculate the possibility that the tree fit to the, sorry, the, the sequence alignment fit to the tree. You have tons of tree, right? But you have one sequence alignment. The probability that se sequence alignment fit to the tree, you get one value. The value called likelihood value, okay? Then, then alignment fit to the second tree, alignment fit to third, three, until the million tree, hundred million trees, and then you find the 
maximum value of likelihood. That's, wh that's why they call maximum likelihood. So if you, you remember 20 taxa, but some people working on 100 taxa, even larger than these, right? The number of possible three is, I mean, three space that the program need to explore is larger than number of star in the universe. So that's the point. After you calculate, you pick up maximum likelihood based on inference, you calculate the tree, you get a tree. And then you need to, to calculate the statistic support. One uh, famous that statistic support is bootstrap. Okay, we can do something else, but bootstrap is seem to be very easy. <coughs> or posterior probability. Okay, let's say bootstrap. Bootstrap is the method of resampling. If you have alignment like this, four taxa, and ten column of alignment, so mini mini matrix. Okay, the bootstrap is I mean you cut the column. Well, you print, you print alignment in the paper and you cut each column and put 10 pieces of paper in a box and you pick up one piece of paper. If you pick up paper number nine, you put number nine at the first column and put a piece of paper number nine back to a box, the box and re-pick up, resampling. You probably get number four. Put number four and then put the piece of paper number four back to the box and resampling until you get the same length of the original alignment. You see, sometimes you pick number nine two times. Sometimes you pick number, number four two times or number two never pick it up, something like that. It's okay. It depends on how many columns that is homo homolog. If you have a tons of homolog column, then your alignment is full of phylogenetic signal. But if you have non-homolog column, I mean, they call homoplasty, and the, it's not the, the real homolog, right? So your, your pseudo alignment will be full of, of noise, phylogenetic noise. When you build a tree, tree always keep the wrong topology. This is the way of the, the, the pseudo alignment generation. <coughs> you need to use the original alignment, build the tree, you made it already, and use original alignment, generate pseudo sample. One, two, three, four, five people's love to do 1,000 pseudo sample, then you have 1,000 alignment. And 1,000, each alignment, you need to build a tree from the pseudo sample. Then you get bootstrap tree, 1,000 bootstrap tree. And then program will help you count how many times in 1,000 that A and B group together. How many times A, B, and C group together? And then that's come from come for, for one number. And then they convert number to percent. We call bootstrap. Bootstrap come out with percent. Can be zero to 100. OK? <coughs> uh, the question is, how many percent is OK? Right? This is, this is subjective. I will say higher is better. It depends it depend on your question, research question. If you want to claim this belong to, well, to claim taxonomy or systematic, you probably get the, the high number. Even you claim the new species that not belong to that genus, so the tree should be separate from, from the former one. So you need the very high. Basically, when, well, it depends. Some textbooks say more than 80%, but I would say 90%. This should be safe for you for, for publish. Um, 85 is, well, some position 85 is okay, but 80 is, hmm, 
maybe yes or no. But if you optimist a little bit, maybe yes. But well, 90% is safe. Once, once the, <coughs> the software calculates three for you, you end up with a pattern that this pattern for bioinformatician, you grab this pattern and can build the tree in so many shapes. Okay, we call Newick format pattern. Uh, if you search, there are more detail of Newick format than, than this slide. You can go to Google and check Newick, Newick format phylogeny. If you type Newick, you get seafood restaurant a lot because the name comes from seafood restaurant where the uh, evolutionist had meeting, okay? So the tree looked like down, downstairs, the, uh, the, the picture underneath the, the, the pattern, A and B close together, they put A, B separate by comma and put the black cat around A, B. That means A, B are closely related. And this A, B, black cat, that means one node closely related to C, they comma and put a letter C and another blanket, something like that. Once the tree ending, they put semicolon. This is the pattern. If you use this one to build a tree, you get the tree down there. But if people say, hey, hang, hang on, Ajahn said some tree has long branch, some position is shorter branch, how software understand that? So we understand by put colon behind the taxa name and put the distant value. Then software will build A from B. Well, A and B have node. A can be 11.997, something like that. So software will understand how to build the tree, okay? That's the general criteria for build the tree, okay? So why do we need phylogeny? Because, because phylogeny can help you answer lots of questions by theoretical question or application. In terms of application, it's e easier. You probably need to know evolution of the set of OTU. Or you want to work with systematic biology, even classification of new species or identify new species. Uh, unknown species. It cannot be species or maybe individual in the species also. It can be pathogen identification. You remember in the very beginning of this year when COVID-19 virus came, the first thing people want to know where they're from. That's the application of phylogeny. Once COVID from that animal, one day, we have tons of COVID patients. We isolate tons of virus. So the next question is, hey, hang on, how many COVID in the population? That's another phylogeny, right? So phylogeny has a lot more application to ident identify this, or forensics. Forensic also, like, uh, how this virus come from, how this DNA come from, okay? Or... This meat in the, well, from the evidence belong to pig or belong to chicken, belong to what? Something like that. You can do phylogeny in metagenomic or microbiome to identify bacteria. In terms of theoretical, well, phylogeny helps to improve the, the substitution. Sorry, this is wrong. Substitution model or help you formulate indel and recombination model, okay? And also identify rate, help you prepare bioinformatics software to handle with big number of phylogeny. Uh, one fancy example that I love to use when I teach students is um, Florida Dentist, HIV, okay? A dentist in Florida, this is a real case published in so many papers. Dentist, a male dentist, he has risk for HIV. One day, 
uh, a female girl in, in July 1990 came and, and sued a dentist because she claimed like she got HIV from her dentist. Okay, that's called patient A. Later on, from the rehab service center, identified two more patients, two more HIV cases that belong to dentist patient that got infected. Um, the the right check that means the dentist has known risk. He probably sleep allow or whatever have high risk, but. Three patients, no risk, but they got infected from dentists. And also, this is the very big case at, the mo at, at that time. Uh, CDC came and matched the list of dentists, patients, and also unknown clinic. Uh, the clinic that checked HIV, and they found one more, one more dentist patient that got positive and no risk also, be a male. And also, patient E and G, they kind of, they, they, they have a symptomatic because no symptom. They don't know they got infected. But patient A and patient D have symptomatic, they got AIDS. Okay, that's why they, they, they know that itself. And patient number E, during she, get service from dentist clinic. She fell in love with another patient and she been a girlfriend, boyfriend for a year and probably transmitted HIV to another, another one called patient F. So this is complicated. Even investigate more, they found more complex case. And also patient number H, this is a very good case that apply phylogeny to forensic. And finally, when we build the tree, based on the paper, we, well, we have, the red one is dentist sequence. We have six dentists, not mean six dentist men, right? One dentist, when they get HIV, they need to, to see doctor so many times. So every time doctor draw his blood. So we have blood along the time he, he met the doctor and he sequenced. Virus keep changing a little bit, a little bit, a little bit every time because it aren't a no proofreading. Uh, if we know the then the all red thing, first thing you when you interpret the tree, you need to identify the recent common ancestor. In this case, you need to identify RCA of dentist. The RCA of dentist is the origin that the I, I made a, a pink box. Okay, so that virus evolved to be so many virus in dentists. So everything that evolved from that time supposed to be the same source of dentists, okay? So we finally get patient G, patient C, patient E, patient A, patient B that get infected with the same virus of dentists, okay? But patient H, patient F, patient D get infected from somewhere else because we use the local people around the clinic also who get HIV, that's a control. That's the, the idea of forensic. <coughs> For idea of um, systematic, one, one great idea is the tree of life. The tree of life starts from uh, the, the work of Dr. Woos, Carl Woos, um, he working on Archaea. And this picture on the, on the left hand side is the 16S structure, okay? 16S structure, I, I call it ideal phylogenetic marker because, because this marker has nine valuable region. And all nine valuable regions separate by 10 conserved regions. So you can use conserved region to design primer. If you want to study V1, V2, V3, you have all possible pair of primer to amplify them. This is very amazing. Uh, and 16F 
here from E. coli and 18 eggs from Saccharomyces, you see overall structure is quite similar, right? Then this is the amazing thing, amazing marker that allow you compare the evolution of prokaryote and eukaryote. Otherwise, they have nothing similar, all right? So comparison of prokaryote and eukaryote first in PNAS 2001. This is the first tree of life. We know the organism on Earth from five kingdoms can be three domains. The thing we learn from this tree of life is bacteria that we formally call uh, kingdom monera. Kingdom monera contain all prokaryotic organisms. They are conquer two domains of life. Actually, the diversity of, of prokaryotic things is larger than you expect. And the, the lower, lower clade belong to eukarya. Eukarya is eukaryote. That belong to four kingdoms, plant, animal, fungi, and protease. Okay? If you consider the tip of plant, animal, fungi, We cannot have mouse, but anyway, at the tip of the, the tree, you probably see human homo sapiens, Z, and Cropinus. That's three representative of three kingdom. The branch is very short, you see. If three kingdom have that different, how many kingdom in eukaryote indeed? So the concept keep need to, to be reconsidered, okay? We believe the three domain of life for a long time, and we believe the root happened in between bacteria and the remaining. So, I mean, I mean, the origin start from something, prokaryotic cells, and evolve to be one side bacteria, another side to be ancestor. That ancestor evolved to be archaea and eukaryote. Archaea is an amazing organism, right? They have eukaryotic machinery inside prokaryotic cells. So that's the, the one. Later on, the concept has been checked by, by a team who study unculturable things. They get marine sample and, and filter and sequence everything. They found unculturable bacteria. They built another tree in Nature Microbiology 2016. The purple one, uh, the picture up there, they are all bacterial domain. The purple one is unculturable. They, when, you, when they implement unculturable bacteria, the culturable, that's so many colors, squeeze to be another side. So there are a lot more things that we never know. And down there is archaea and eukarya. The green one is eukarya. The concepts change from, from the side of eukarya and archaea, not just divide to be two group, archaea and eukarya. It means like archaea is paraphyletic. Just one archaea evolved to be eukaryote. Okay, that's the check, the, the idea that come out. So we still need to debate. And 2000, around 10, we discover of a new viruses, a new virus called giant virus from amoeba. Giant virus contain the particle, it's quite huge particle. The chromosome is bigger than smallest bacterial chromosome. They contain tons of gene. Then when we sequence, we hope Giant virus will be missing link to understand where virus come from. Virus may be the origin of the cellular organism, something. They try to identify gene. Uh, they know the gene of the, 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 the homologous gene of giant virus with the other cellular organism and build a tree and come out with the idea, the fourth domain of life. Okay, at that time, people like, pay a lot more attention. You see the red one is the, the fourth domain of life. 
the upper one is eukarya, bacteria, and the green is archaea, and have one red domain. At that time, we, we know just an, a handful of sequence of giant virus. Later on, people keep investigate or discover a new giant virus. One fancy paper from PNAS, uh, because giant virus is huge, the way they call virus is similar to the way they call bacteria. They use Latin name with two uh, binomial nomenclature. This virus in the picture is Pitovirus sibericum. They, they, they digging the ice from Siberia in permafrost, the ice that never melt for 30,000 years. When they melt it, they're trying to sequence and also they put the, the, the sting in solution on any melt ice, put in so many cell culture and finally, virus can kill amoeba. So they infect amoeba and kill amoeba. That's, we, we found a lot more. We call pitovirus because, because the shape is, look like a jar. In Greek, jar called pitos. Okay, this the jar shape. And when we know more virus, we build a tree and we end up with the virus is not monophyletic actually. So the idea of the fourth domain of life may be wrong. Actually, it is virus, like the small virus. But this virus has ability to absorb the other gene from eukaryote, gene from bacteria, gene from archaea, gene from environment. That makes the, the chromosome big. So that should be the story of, of giant virus. So tree of life help us know a lot more things. <clears throat> For bacteria, the tree of life bacteria is mean, they, they, people try to build a tree from so many bacteria. The purple one, if you, if you see the pattern of the, the bacterial tree, you see um, one interesting point is people believe the photosynthetic bacteria evolved very early on Earth, and they accumulate the, well, they have ability to convert light to be energy and then release oxygen. And with those bacteria, for a long, long time, they accumulate oxygen on, on the atmosphere of Earth. So, and that bacteria evolved to be so many species of photosynthetic bacteria, but when we map the tree of bacteria, we found uh, coliflex, coliflexi, firmicute, proteobacteria, cyanobacteria, and colibri. They are all photosynthetic bacteria. It means like photosynthesis happen on Earth more than one time. They are independent events that try to evolve. They're not come from the one origin. But they evolve to be five different groups of at least five, because some, some photosynthetic bacteria we don't discover yet. There's only cyanobacteria that generate oxygen. The other use sulfur. They have green sulfur, uh, purple sulfur, depend on the pigment in, in the machinery, photosynthetic machinery. So that's the idea. For eukaryote, for eukaryote, here is a tree of life eukaryote. Actually, we have updated version, but this one, this one show up at least, at least uh, eight different groups of eukaryote evolve. Okay, uh, let's see the, the green circle, the green oval. That is all land plants. That is one kingdom. The, down there, Two, two oval, two blue oval. One is animal, one is fungi. So the thing we learn a lot with three kingdom present in very small position on the tree of life eukaryote. So eukaryote is evolved or diverse than we expect, okay? Animal and fungi share the same ancestor. We call opistoconta. Opisto is mean the, the back. Cont means flagella. When, when the cell move, in that direction, flagella will place behind because flagella is at the back of the cells, like 
imagine sperm cells when sperm cells move in this direction, fractalized here. Some eukaryote, when they move in that direction, fractalized at flaunt. There are so many. Okay. We have amoebozoa, archiplastida, rosaria, alveolate, staminopyro, discochristate. There are so many. Um, what we learned from tree of life eukaryote, one is myxomycete fungi. Mix, uh, previously, we call slimo myxomycete because they are exceptional. The, this is fungi with, without cell wall. They not release extracellular enzyme, digest and absorb, but they phagocytose. So one, nowadays, we know that this is not fungi anymore. They move to amoebozoa, the blue one. That is different kingdom of fungi. And also one group of fungi that people call water mole, oomycete. Oomycete moved to the purple one. If you see the purple, you see oomycete that closely related to diatom, brown algae. So oomycete, previously they photosynthesize, but they lost the ability to catching the light energy. That's why they turn to be, to be parasite, okay? The yellow one, probably hard to observe, one group of that called AP complexa. Inside that, one, one famous AP complexa is malaria, right? But the other friend in alveolate are dinoflagellate. Ciliate, they are all photosynthesis. So malaria also has coloplast remnant in the cells. That's why tree of life tell you where they're from and why they keep that. If you never build the tree of life, you never know that gene loss happened in this group of organisms. Okay. <clears throat> Another normal phylogeny test is, I like to share my, my, my work for dictyosilium, I went to, when I came back, I, I, I want to do some diversity of hidden microbes. So I went to Amnajaren province and well, Amper, Mueang and Pana is district. So we went to Amper Mueang, pick up some soil in the community forest. Uh, down there in Pana, they have like one, well, kind of big area of community forest and build phylogeny. We built phylogeny of dictyos in, in northeastern. Uh, the red one on the tree is the species that we found in Thailand. Uh, I try to use phylogeny to identify genus of these organisms. When I identify genus of these organisms, how do I sure this isolate belong to dictyosilium. You probably need to, to observe the RCA of dictyosilium. The bootstrap support is 100%. That's why I claim if the bootstrap support is low, 50%, probably another 50, they group with the other organism. So we cannot claim that, okay? So all genus, contain 100% bootstrap. Uh, another side of theoretical application of phylogeny, this probably evaluate indel marker. So indel happen by insertion or deletion, right? If you have two sequence, you can't say insertion or deletion. You need the third sequence, right? The third sequence, that's similar to the original state. And you observe like the event similar, well, A, B, one present and one absent. You need to know the original state that share the sequence with the origin. If the sequence of origin present, so the absent one is the new one. We call this deletion, something like that. So with the tree, we, I, I, I working on, on I was work uh, the tree of animal, fungi, and plant. The upper one is animal. 
the later on is fungi and the, the lowest one is plant and green algae. <coughs> we observe insertion and deletion separately happen in genome. The yellow one is insertion. The green one is deletion. You can see along the evolutionary line, insertion happen larger than deletion, particularly in the group of fungi and plant down there. And the purple is the proportion of insertion by deletion. So we know the general term is 2.3. 2.3 means generally along the three kingdoms, insertion happen more often than deletion 2.3 times. Okay, that's some, some example of, of the, the tree. Until um, 2008, new technology come out. Well, we are entering omic era, right? Next generation DNA sequencing come out, make the, the price for sequencing, genome sequencing drop. Okay, so everyone can sequence genome. Okay, just save the, the money for thoroughly can get one bacterial genome. Uh, the paradigm from working in biology from one tree, one organism, then you need to think about the whole forest. It's like omic, right? When omic coming, you, well, I, I, I'll talk about the omic a little bit. The idea of omic, for manipulate when when one want to do the the omic thing, you probably need to know like you you take sample, sequence the whole genome, and then start analyze. The analysis of the omic can contain primary, secondary, and third tertiary. The primary one is QC QA of the data that you get out from the machine, okay? This probably spent one day to do that. Later on, secondary analysis probably be um, gene mapping, uh, sing, uh, the novel assembly of the, the genome, something like that. That's mostly uh, uh, pipe, they have pipeline for working or handling with those analysis. One, you get sequence from assembly, from mapping, or you get single nucleotide variants or SNP from analysis by secondary anal analysis steps. Then you're entering tertiary analysis. One of the famous tertiary analysis is phylogenetics. And phylogenetic of the whole genome now change the paradigm also we call phylogenomic. Okay, so phylogenomic is not just one gene. You use the whole genome. Before the whole genome, people try to use multi-locus phylogeny. Instead of one gene, you probably sequence four or five genes. Some people have more money, sequence 20 genes, even richer, 40 genes, 100 genes, and combine, concatenate, and build a tree, make a super matrix, but now, we we entering the, the, the era of phylogenomic, okay? Phylogenomic can do in two main styles. One is alignment-based phylogeny. Another one is alignment-free phylogeny. Alignment-based phylogeny, you probably get the whole genome alignment. You get the whole genome series and align whole genome. This might work well with organisms with low mutation rate, not, not much or not so many gene shuffling. For example, mycobacterium tuberculosis, the genome is very conserved, then you probably study population of MTB in one area with the whole genome alignment. Or <coughs> you identify ortholog first, and then align ortholog one by one, and concatenate orthologous gene to be a very huge alignment, a very huge metric we call concatenate gene alignment. Or you just identify SNV phylogeny, 
S N V is mean the position that kind of variants when you align thousand of of sequence, some sequence show up A, some sequence show up T, that's S N V. But if you prove that this mutation happen more than 1% of the population, you probably call that SNP. Uh, this is tricky also if you never clean the data and you use all change that you count, you probably get synchrotron. The synchrotron is mean from 1,000, just only one, one isolate change from A and the remaining are T. That probably risk because that is 0.1%, not just rich 1%. It might be error from sequencing, okay? If this marker is valid enough, there should be some isolate in the population show up with this. Otherwise, when you clean, you get another... Well, if you not clean it, it means like you, you implement all error, all noise, in the phylogenetic analysis. That's the point. Okay. So uh, this is the work from MTB in Chiang Rai province. We sequenced 1,200 about and found that uh, the sequence of MTB in Chiang Rai by SNV comprised four different groups, uh, the blue one is called lineage one, the red ones called lineage two, and the green and purple is lineage three and four. And also we use phylogenomic to solve the lineage one, just only the blue one, get the three, we know the blue divided to be at least five major clade inside lineage one, we call 1.1. But the, the, way, the way MTB guys working is quite headache, like 1.1.1.1 .1 is very confused. Okay, <clears throat> sometime you need to deal with species that incomplete genome. You don't have the whole genome. You probably take some from, well, some species have complete genome and some species almost complete. When you identify gene or get large population, you probably get nothing for universal because some species keep exceptional. Like, okay, for this group of species, maybe gene loss, but gain in another species, if you are so strict, you get nothing. You probably need to, to relax or you want to implement your species, but just sequence half genome. Don't know how to complete it yet. Don't have money, don't whatever. You don't have enough gene to build a tree. Uh, alignment free is a way to, to escape that limitation. Uh, one thing I will say that is the word based method. Word-based method is mean you, you think about sliding sequence you have to be a small chunk we call Kamer. Probably, well, Kamer is mean any, any size. For example, 11 Kamer is mean like the sequence with 11 base length. You slide every one base, you get another new Kamer, one base. You slice to be the whole chunk of sequence, and you count how many pattern, A, 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 11 times, A, 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 10 times, and C, A, 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 10 times, and G, all combination. You have big combination, and you, you use those combination to build the tree, okay? This is quick because, because uh, you, you convert sequence to be matrix distant matrix, and you use matrix, the distance, to build a tree. If you use uh, character base, this is take forever for running phylogenomic of the huge genome. Uh, that one is good to have a, a big picture of the genome phylogeny. Uh, there are some software to deal with that. 
CV3, Andy, FFP, or Kisune. Kisune is the one, the software that just launched a few days ago. Um, the good point is this software helps you organize, uh, optimize how long of the, of the camera. Otherwise, you need to try yourself, write a script to try like five camera, six camera, seven, up to whatever camera that you think like is optimum. And every camera data set, you need to build the tree. That takes a lot of time. So this software is help you organize that. And this is the tree of, of E. coli and Chigella. So they separate E. coli and Chigella into two different patterns and also based on phylo group by colors. The upper, upper clade are, uh, is Chigella and lower one is E. coli. And among E. coli, you see E. coli, they have so many phylo, phylo group. That's the, the idea. So I'd like to share with you like, like this for the, the idea of application of phylogeny. If you want to know more particulars, particular question, you probably need to follow the, the instruction that that software help or, uh, tell you. Uh, but mostly they, they follow this instruction. Okay, so what you learn today, you learn the, the terminology, the important terminology that involves phylogeny and also how to build phylogeny in concept and how to apply phylogenetic in, in the other research, how to use phylogeny to answer some research question, right? And the new paradigm of phylogeny in phylogenomic. Okay, uh, I'd like to, to thank you uh, biotech, uh, TBRC, and micro, and they are all organization, even BDM from my, my institute that I'm working on and Mahidon University. Thank you very much. Um. <laughs> Thank you, Ke. And um, we come to the last session, question and answer. Is there any question from this room? Well, um, it seems that we have questions from our online participants. Okay, um, please. Okay. Uh, may I ask you, uh, instead of them, uh, could you please explain more with polytomy case? The polytomy case actually uh, is a position on the tree where they, uh, where is my mouse? When we build a tree, the tree is supposed to be bifurcate. It means from origin, divide to be A and B only. But if some point that the tree end up with A, B, C, something like that, that's polytomy. Polytomy can happen by, by the limitation of calculation. Sometimes you're working on maximum likelihood, they measure the score, right? But end up with two best three. This one and this one get the same score. That is maximum. The way is you, you can combine two, two phylogeny. That makes some region of the tree can be polytomy because they have the same pattern or conflict pattern, then, then you combine together. That's also polytomy. Or sometimes you calculate that and you get polytomy as answer. Well, in-depth, polytomy can be two different types. One is soft polytomy. Soft polytomy is mean you pick up not enough phylogenetic signal to separate that. Or you use the wrong method. You use the wrong model. That's why they cannot solve the tree clearly. Another one is harder. We call hard polytomy. Hard polytomy is mean, well, the time when the, 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 the evo uh, speciation time of the organism that you're working with has two rate. 
two two rates. Some is short rate and some is longer rate. For example, if you're working on animal phylogeny, if you want to build for animal from all phylum, you probably get stuck with mammal. Mammal in the time when dinosaur extinct, they have no hunter for small mammal because the big dinosaur die out. So the small rodent at the time they breed quite quick and then they multiply, occupy the the earth, start separating or uh, speciation happen very quick. So in a very short time, you get so many species that faster than the, the regular rate. So if you have something evolve very quick, quick and evolve in the normal rate, in the same tree, you probably get stuck. And those are show up with polytomy because they, they, they show up like they evolve at the same time. But actually, when you change the scale of the tree, you see the pattern happen in the very narrow time something like that. But if you have biology to support, that is hard polytomy. This happened like this indeed. But mostly if you don't have biology strong enough to claim that probably wrong method or, or you can improve that by implement more sequence signal. That's the polytomy story. Um, thank you. Another question. Uh, this is from Dr. Gok Tan Tan. Um, I obtained 16,381 OTUs from chicken gut from 16 srRNA applicants. Is it make sense or too large to be real? May I know how to filter out? Uh, this need to, to go back with the, the research question. If you want to filter out, filter what out? If I try to answer in general, in general sense. First thing, I can deal with the, the large amount of sequence like this. We need to identify how many sequence pattern. Sometimes you sequence 16S from, well, 10,000, some sequence have exactly the same, some pieces of DNA had exactly the same sequence. Well, we throw some away. We keep just one pattern one non-redundant pattern, and then we start from that non-redundant. If, if the, well, if you want to show the tree of everything, that's a serious problem. You need computational power. But if you want to show how many in a bar chart, I would say you can do so many phylogeny with 100 sequence, 100 sequence, 100 sequence, and then you identify, identify them. Once you split the, the, the sample size to be so many hundreds, it's easier and faster to identify sequence. And don't forget to, to pick some from different data set, combine and build a tree again, kind of different group control to make the, the tree, something like that. It might help in general sense for microbiome, right? I don't know how to, why people need to throw some sequence away. That's only one reason I throw away because they are exactly the same sequence. And, and, and finally, you, you end up with this pattern has large amount of, of isolates, n equal to 10, n equal to one, something like that. Next question. How identify tiny gene mutation from any species because it is not appear on uh, on phenotypes almost new almost new species or rare were started from tiny gene mutation tiny gene mutation need to be clarified first mutation can be in there insertion deletion or substitution okay if you build a tree and you want to observe tiny mutation, I would say you probably need to have a tree first. And then you point some group of some clade, pick up one clade. For example, if I build a vertebrate tree, I want to, to see mutation in mammal. 
mammal is clade, I will pick the mammal sequence and align, observe by the alignment, scan alignment. You, you probably get some, some mutation that's observed. It, it is hard to observe in Dale after you build a tree because you throw away in Dale already, right? Mostly, mostly are substitution, but, but this one, if, if, well, back to the, the basic one, if you want to observe substitution, just only one, well, two main reasons that you want to do is identify sequence signal that's specific to the group of clade or identify SNP. If you want to identify SNP, they have a lot of software to help you. But if you want to observe sequence signal, you probably, well, the software, might be some software, but, but I recommend, well, phylogeneticists would love to work with manual, observed by eyes. Alignment also, when you, when you perform alignment in any software, you need to editing by hand also because no software is better than you, right? Thank you. Next question. Between this 10-based and character-based methods, uh, which one is better to illustrate the evolution relationship? Of course, character-based. And, and you, if you want to publish in a very high-impact journal like cladistic or molecular biology evolution, it almost automatically, if, if you use neighbor joining or distant, kind of automatically reject. If you want to claim evolution, you need to do ML, BI, something like that. But I would say, I would say distant method is work with bioinformatic task. If you have tons of sequence set, you want to see the, the tree topology of 1,000 genes in the universal core set, something like that. How many distro, uh, conflict phylogeny, then you probably need NJ. It's faster. The next question. If we construct phylogenetic tree, do you suggest to delete the gap region for better tree construction? Of course, because we don't have the model for, except we don't have the model for Indale except you implement some Indale model inside that. There are some technique for, well, the thing that people still miss the concept for Indale, when you have insertion, I mean very clear and clean insertion with three amino acid and 10 amino acid, both of them are one genetic event. We don't know shorter DNA integrate easier than longer DNA or not, but one genetic event, right? Integrate just one time. But if you count by substitution model, you try to implement the longer one get so many substitution, and that's by S. By S to the longer one, right? That's the point. The second question from the same person. For the 16 RNA sequence to identify bacteria, what method do you suggest for construction on phylogenetic tree? And how do we decide how many bootstrap should we use? Well, it depends. Like, like I said, um, this, this question probably come out at uh, the end of first talk. Uh, ML and BI, supposed to be a good method, but, but for, for you who are working with a huge tree, I recommend like this. You need to get some idea of the tree. You probably run NJ or whatever. The, the ML tree will, will be slightly different from the NJ, but not totally different, okay? But the, the correct position, the NJ tree may generate some problematic clade, problematic OTU. But you get idea like, okay, uh, most of them, I implement 10 genera and, and show up with 10 genera with some naughty OTU that not belong to the, the same genera. And then you use ML and BI. At a time, you have some idea to, to draft the manuscript or to manipulate something else. That, that's 
the quick idea, but you you do not use the the NJ to publish. And also, when you working on bootstrapping, some software, the not a new version software, they they're not smart enough. They just show the bootstrap tree. That tree is incorrect. You don't use bootstrap tree to publish. You need to use original tree. But use number on bootstrap tree add in the original tree because original tree show the the length by the the correct alignment. The bootstrap tree use the the branch length by pseudo sample. That's not the, the real sample. But they they help you organize the number and then use number add in the in the original alignment original tree. But new software they they do that for you. So you need to be careful on that, also. N next question: um, Can you differentiate maximum likelihood, uh, max parsimony, or Bayesian, Bayesian interference? <coughs> how they how are they different, and when it is used best? Well, that's probably the 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 the, the question before I I, I show you the detail of this. Parsimony is the oldest technique for phylogeny, the first technique. They work well with uh, morphology. When I study, I, I try to, to implement the, the method to, to work with Indale. So first thing, I, I think about parsimony because if we count Indale by character, one in there mean one character. One in there, one character like this. I try to avoid the length of sequence. Parsimony may be great. And surprisingly, lots of people have no idea how to deal with parsimony because they are all technique, except, except one group of people who are working with dinosaur bone. They email me back like, come, I will teach you how to do that. <laughs> the parsimony, because they don't have DNA. They're digging the bone, they use morphology. And they build a tree based on morph morphological character. So morphology is good. But for molecular, molecular, it is hard to identify. Well, the point is parsimony help you, allow you to weight by character. But you don't know how to weight this gene, this position, and another position in the same gene. That's why molecular parsimony end up with quite a lot of error. But I would say parsimony is good for, for uh, morphology. For ML and BI, it use different technique. ML, ML is identify probability that alignment fit to the tree and identify the maximum one. BI Identify probability that tree fit to the alignment. You see this opposite way. That's why I encourage you to do both technique. Mm. Okay. Um, the next question is from Dr. Tin Marlin. Would like to ask about the difference of neighbor joining tree and maximum likelihood tree. Which one is better if we use bootstrap method to show the phylogeny tree of bacteria? And I am not clear which one should I use. Thank you. Uh, you probably probably use both, but the thing that help you make it a bit more clear, uh, maximum likelihood you can use bootstrap to evaluate, like, like I show you in the slides in the second talk. But for, for Bayesian, let's say like this, Bayesian is statistic, when you toss a coin, you probably get head or tail only, okay? How high of the probability to get head? I'm sure like you guys think in, in your mind 0 0.5 because you learn in the class, right? But this, this probability number cannot apply to all coins on earth. Some coins contained by S maybe end up with head a little, little more than tail, or some coins end up with tail a little more than 
hate, right? Bayesian will help you identify the we call posterior probability. After you calculate that, the, the prior probability is 0 0.5 hate. The posterior may be 0 0.49 hate. That's the correct way, okay, of the Bayesian. So Bayesian will not testing, we, we don't have uh, bootstrap, but they instead they, they have a posterior probability. In every node, they show up with 0 to 1 instead of 0 to 100. And I think 0 to 1 is easier for you to understand phylogeny. It's like ABC grouped together in 0 0.99 probability. That means likely to get this, right? But bootstrap is harder to understand because you need to convert. Like, okay, they generate pseudo data, and 99% of pseudo data get this pattern. So probability is easier to understand, I think. The next question, how to choose the best method to construct phylogenetic tree? Well, the same, ML and BI, something like that. Um, the next one, may I elaborate more on the issue you raise on data gathering, such as getting the highest hit for the sequence, but you mentioned that it was not correct. I am not sure if you have mentioned it as my internet is not permitted. Okay, okay. Um, I'll say like this, like, like the, I said, five species. And, and if people sequence two species and put in a gen bank, and you blast it, if you're working with particular organism like, like fungi, some people working famous fungi like Cordyceps, you probably know like not only you working on Cordyceps because it's very famous. There are lots of people working on Cordyceps. And some sequence of Cordyceps is not in the NCBI, right? How can you blast and get hit to the all possible? This is impossible. NCBI is just big pool, but not all, right? That, the reason is, Blast will work for identify if two things, all variants on Earth are implemented in the database. That is impossible. Second thing is uh, the concept of DNA barcoding is correct for that group of organisms. Barcoding is, is fail because, well, when you, when you want to know Cordyceps or any bacteria, you know this is bacteria. You, you help them identify until this is, or, or maybe, or maybe let's, say, let's say frog. The, by, by morphology, you know this is frog in this genus. You're not sure like species A, B, or C, or D. Then you use sequence and blast. You probably get one or two or three or four only. But it failed because when you pick up DNA from metagenome, you have no idea DNA of frog might be similar to lily, similar to sunflower, similar to protease. I will say if you're working with, with markers such as cytochrome C oxidase, CO1, 400 base, I, I mean selected 400 base in CO1, super conserved, how many sequence pattern can generate from 400 base? Some people say four time 400 possibility of sequence, but that's not true because four times 400 is sample space. Some are CO1, some are protease, some are DNA polymerase. They can't mutate much. If they mutate too much, they lost function. Selection keep them just number of mutation. And how thing thousand pattern can separate million species. You need marker that have more than millions pattern to, to differentiate million things. That's why we never care of frog might be similar to protease because you know this is frog. You want to know A, B, C, or D. But if you know no idea, this is DNA from 
wastewater. You might end up, oh, I don't know why sunflower has a lot in, in the wastewater pond, but actually they're similar to some bacteria. And you don't, you don't know correctly when the gene transfer also. They might absorb the gene from environment inside them. This is the problematic. That's why blast alone is risk to be wrong than to be right. I, I don't say blast is completely wrong. Some group of organisms, they, they build up with very complete data. That's okay. But don't use this for any species. You probably risk to the wrong one. Um, the next question. <laughs> From your experience, are there any specific challenges when doing phylogenetic tree from deploy or polyploy plants? I don't know. Deploy and this. Uh, well, like I need to answer like this. It depends on question. Well, if you want to build the tree of so many species inside one species they have variation, right? If I want to build phylogeny of flowers, flowering plants, one species like sunflower has tons of variation. I need to pick up the type strain, just only one. If you go to NCBI, they have a small button. You click the ref seek, reference sequence, then they get one sequence from that gene and use that as a representative of sunflower, okay? Because tons of mutation happen after sunflower split from the other ancestor, okay? When, when ancestors split to A and B, all mutation in A happen after A starts splitting out, so you use any sequence is okay. Like this, no need to use them all. I, I think that, I don't know this help or not. Uh, this can be avoided from poly, polyploid. I think polyploid probably get a very similar sequence. I don't know, maybe slightly different, right? In terms of, polyploid is like duplication of chromosome, right? Not sure I understand the question correctly or not, but, but use the type strain might be the representative, and you avoid the, that okay. should, should be. Okay, um, the next question, which type of species can I choose for our isolated bacteria? Uh, for example, Lactobacillus plantanum or Bactolatilus genus? Mm. <laughs> like I said, five species. If, if there are five now, you need to use all five. Otherwise, you don't know where is the, the, the correct position. And if you have five, only five species, you need at least three per one species. Then you have 15, right? 15 control. You, before you build a tree, you need to pick up five or 15 sequence three belong to one species and build a tree from 15 first and let see 15 species separate well, bootstrap okay, and then you just add your unknown sequence inside. If you not test the tree by the sequence and implement the, the unknown first, then it's kind of hard to, to interpret. And once you add the unknown inside and unknown project out from the tree, inner the RCA, then you claim this belong to that RCA claim. But if your unknown spread out deeper the RCA, this probably, well, you can't draw the conclusion. You need to identify the, the deeper RCA, the deeper node. That is detail, mm. but it should be care on this. I think this is supposed to be important point because lots of people miss identification in these steps. Okay, um, last three questions. Last three questions, okay. 
I would like to know just only mutant genes on the whole gene, whole gene. Which method is suitable for that, please? Me? Uh, would like to know only mutant genes, mutant genes on the whole gene. Which method is suitable for that? I don't know I understand the question correctly. If you want to know the mutation in, in that, just sequence and align and done. Because if the, the sequence is exactly the same with the, the reference, there's no mutation, right? So next, if I have allelic data, which tools or program are suitable for construct phylogenetic tree? I say any program is okay. Just like you're working with statistics, you need to know what is t-test, what is chi-square. Any program can end up with the same test. If uh, Minitab say significant, SPSS also significant. It depends on if you train yourself from one software, you just use that software until, until the, the, the three characteristic is beyond that software can do. Okay. I, I, for me, I, I, I like the software that can manipulate. I don't like the black box. I mean, put the sequence inside, click, and then get the tree. I don't know the program do something for me. It is hard to write the, the methodology. Well, when you read the paper and see methodology, okay, I use sequence and program A, version five, done. It is hard to repeat the experiment because they, they didn't tell like how high of the substitution mutation, the rate of this equal to what, something blah, blah, blah. You, you need to, to keep in mind the default parameters come from the set of organisms that that scientist working in the, for example, if I build a software and I'm working on yeast, I probably set the default by yeast because it makes me working easier. If you're not working with yeast, you probably need to optimize the, the parameter yourself, right? Something like that. The last question. <laughs> In the lecture, you said for unknown sample, you said for unknown sample, blasting, choosing set of sequence from the blast result, and construct three is not enough. What is your suggestion on the best best step to construct of three? I am working on the unknown bacteria sample using sixteen RNA. Well. The reason I say not enough because you, you probably need to, to if, if this is super unknown, I pick up a very lucky, pick up the very new bacteria. Blast hit nothing. I choose no uh, uh, bacterial phylum. Might be, for example, 20 phylum, 20 phyla. I pick up 20 phyla first. I need to identify this one belong to which phyla first. Once I know this belongs to phyla A, I'm looking for how many clades inside the phyla A. No one phylogeny can answer everything. You need to build a lot more phylogeny. In phyla A, it might be 20 classes, then you probably pick up 20 classes, and then you put this one inside, inside uh, the, the, the data set, and then belong to class B, then Class B contain how many orders? Then you, you just go one by one step. One phylogeny for me spend like half a year to answer that. Well, that's the, 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 the suggestion. You need to go from the very broad until you go to the na narrow one if you want to identify. But if you have massive sequence, this way uh, phylogenetic base may be not a good idea, right? You probably need Blast bait first. Blast bait, some lots of blast. You get, okay, blast hit this sequence A. Blast hit sequence B. And then you cluster. 
just only A come to build phylogeny. They, they help, it helps you uh, reduce the, the number of massive sequence. Mm, that's the idea. Okay, thank you, Dr. Praveet. Look like we conclude our um, seminar for today. And ladies and gentlemen, we are come to the end of the today's seminar. On behalf of TBRC Biotech, I would like to thank Prof Assistant Professor Dr. Praveet for sharing informative presentation with us. Thank you to the audience and party out of both in this room and also our uh, about 100 online participants for being able to attend our seminar today. Thank you.